Hello. Hi. How are you? Welcome to another live edition of Podcast by George. Join us on the uh, Podcast by George live line this morning is Dr. Andrew Nish. He's our guy that's been advising us, kind of walking us through this app, uh, this uh, pandemic and uh, COVID-19. More news as there always is. Some things that I had to ask to get some uh, answers on, and he's here to uh, share it with us. Uh, Dr. Nish, thanks uh, for coming back on a Podcast by George. Hey, my pleasure. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So, you know, first and uh, foremost here, let's talk about the top of my news of the day, and, and unless you've got something else you want to talk about. But with me, it's vaccinations. I'm wondering what I'm going to get mine. I'm wondering if there's going to be enough to go around. I, I'm wondering if it's going to be the right vaccination for the variants that are out there. I mean, I, I got a lot of questions, as you can see. So maybe take it from the top. Tell us where we're at on this thing. And you expect me to have the answers. <laughs> uh, you're asking questions we don't have answers to, George. Yeah. So, y yeah, you know, so there's this, you know, there's a lot in the paper. There's a lot in the news about using half the dose, making the doses go farther, yeah. ex extending the time between the first dose and the second dose so we can get more doses into the, initially into people. And these are all speculative. I mean, these vaccines were approved and they were studied in phase three trials as two doses 21 and 28 days apart. And so all this talk of having the dose and extending the time is not scientifically valid right now. And so I want people to understand that this is pure speculation, okay? Um, there is some data. So if we look at the Moderna vaccine, they did look at 600 people in a phase two trial. So you have to remember there's phase one, two, and three. Phase one is exploratory. Does this cause harm in humans? So it's really looking at the toxicity of a treatment. And if the toxicity profile is good, then we move on to phase two, where we test a few thousand people to see if there's an immune response, to see if there's a response to the vaccine and it's still safe. And then you have the large phase three trials where you're testing tens of thousands of people looking for efficacy of the vaccine and looking for potential toxicities of the vaccine. So in a phase two subset, they took 600 people and in the Moder they gave them the Moderna vaccine. <clears throat> they gave them two vaccinations, 21 days apart, and they used half the dose. So the standard dose was 100 micrograms, 21 days apart. They used 50 micrograms, 21 days apart. And the only thing they were looking for is, did the body elicit an immune response? And the answer to that is, yes, it did. Mm. What they didn't look at is, how effective was that vaccine in protecting that person from COVID? So this talk of having the vaccine dose is very premature because we don't know the answer to whether that actually protects people. And they are going to be doing that study. So the, the intent is, and this was always the intent according to Moderna, that they were gonna look at using half the dose, but that study is going to take two to three months. So right now, we don't know the answer to that. And right now, the dose is 100 micrograms for the Moderna vaccine given 21 days apart. End of story. Anything, after, anything outside of that is not scientifically valid right now. But here's, we're putting the cart a little bit ahead of the horse. Here's the real problem. So this was just written in the New York Times yesterday, and it was on the AMA website this morning. The problem right now is not having enough vaccine it's getting that vaccine distributed. So we have, according to the CDC, as of yesterday morning, 17,020,575 doses of vaccine have been distributed, but only 4,856,469 have actually been injected. So we have not a problem with getting doses we have a problem with the distribution of doses right now. We don't have a system that's efficient enough to distribute all of these vaccine doses that we have out there. We think that's going to change. We think we'll have better distribution. We think we'll have better vaccination. You know, there's talk of distributing these to large pharmacy chains, CV CVS and Walgreens. But the problem right now isn't the production of the vaccine, it's the actual distribution of the vaccine. 
So saying, oh, we can have the dose at this point in time makes no sense because we have plenty of vaccine out there. It's getting it into people's arms. So that's where we are right now. I wanted to click here on this uh, different shirt. So I want to show people. I got, I got on my white shirt, my white. I, got, like, I looked at this doc while we were waiting to come on the air. And I, you know, I, I look a little like a doctor. Doc, I always wanted to be a doctor, but I was, was too dumb. <laughs> and I also don't oh, think I could. George, come on. <laughs> you can't. You can't. You can't. Well, do I was that. too lazy. Okay. Let's look at it that way. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'll go with that. Yeah. Okay. I'm too lazy. Okay. So, um, but also, I don't think I could deal with the frustration of being a doctor and particularly dealing with patients that won't take care of themselves and they get sick and then they come to you. And I, oh, oh, my God. Um, so I look at this and I think of the frustration of, of what we're dealing with right now. A lot of our earlier podcasts were dealing with you and I talking about the amazing speed with which this vaccine was developed. And now the distribution maybe isn't as fast as a lot of people think that it should be. But really, we're still way ahead of the curve on this thing, aren't we? Oh, yeah. You know, we have to put it into a historical perspective and that this is historical in that the speed of development of the vaccine and the actual time from the bench to people's arms has been an extraordinary human achievement. And so, you know, again, you know, there's two sides to every coin and you can look at the one side of the coin and say, well, this is a disaster. We haven't gotten enough vaccine out, but let's look at the other side that we are incredibly fortunate to even have a vaccine right now. I mean, can you imagine yeah that we go into 2021 with no vaccine even on the horizon? That's what history would have told us. But history has changed. We have changed the trajectory of vaccination, of vaccine development by this incredible technology that we've been developing over decades. And so let's look at it on the positive side, that we actually have a vaccine that 20 years ago, you never would have saw this quickly and that that vaccine is incredibly effective, effective, more effective than we had hoped, and that yes, we're going to get it to people, but it's, you know, my dad is 90 years old and he's always like, oh, I'm gonna get the vaccine next month. And I said, no, you're not, because I understand, I've been in science and I've been in medicine too long. It doesn't always happen like you put draw it on paper. And um, so, you know, we, we, we're going to have this distribution. It is going to take a little longer than we expected, but that's, that's the way it is. We've never done this before, okay? We've never tried to vaccinate 300 million people before in a short period of time. Of course, there's going to be logistic problems. Of course, there's going to be kinks in the system because the system is being developed as we go. So I want people to remember that and give these people who are working hard the benefit of the doubt. This is not a perfect system. This system is new, it's developing, we're learning as we go, but it's incredible where we are given where we were a year ago. All right, so that brings us to the next major point that I wanted to talk about. And I know that you uh, follow uh, Dr. Fauci uh, very closely. And I can correct me if I'm wrong, because I can get stuff wrong, <laughs> but tr <laughs> trust me. But was Dr. Fauci telling us this week that we need to keep uh, pushing out this uh, vaccine maybe faster than we are because these variants are coming along and it's kind of an equilibrium. We, uh, if we don't get it out there, uh, the, the new variant will come along uh, with more people being infected because it's more infectious and we could have a real problem. Am I getting that right? Is that what he was telling us? Yeah. I mean, Dr. Fauci is always, he's, he's advocating for more rapid distribution of the vaccine. That's for sure. And he really thinks that in the next few weeks, we'll be able to get up to a speed of about a million people per day. Um, uh, these variants. So you know, yeah. there's been there's lots of different variants. The most recent one has come out of the United Kingdom. Uh, it was first found in this country in someone in Colorado who, f incidentally, did not travel to the United Kingdom. It's being found in many places in the world. It appears right now that it increases the contagiousness of the disease, but not the um, effect of the disease, meaning it's not more deadly than the standard coronavirus. There's been a lot of talk about, are these vaccines gonna be protective? 
And when you listen to the pharmaceutical companies and you listen to the experts, they think it will probably be protective. But again, do we know that? No, we won't know that until we vaccinate people and see if they end up getting this variant of coronavirus. Um, Dr. Fauci's concern is, you know, we have uh, many pockets in the country that are really struggling with coronavirus, particularly Los Angeles County. Um, and if this variant begins to disseminate throughout the population, it being more contagious, then we may see even a bigger spike in cases. That's his real concern. And that's why he would like to see the process of vaccination accelerate to a point where we can get a million people vaccinated a day. Well, let's hope we can. Let's hope it happens. Uh, the thing I wonder about with the variants, uh, again, we, we don't understand uh, whether or not the current uh, vaccines are going to be that effective against them. I mean, there's a possibility that it, it won't be as effective against a variant strain as it is the strain that they were developed for. Sure, it's possible. I mean, that's look at the flu vaccine. We change the flu vaccine every year because these, these viruses mutate. And, you know, we don't know in the future, are we going to have to have yearly coronavirus vaccinations? I don't know the answer to that. And our scientists don't know the answer to that because we haven't been able to study this long enough to understand the protective effect of a single vaccine against all these variants. So but it's going to be a constant work in progress and a constant development and shift in thinking based on data and scientific analysis. This might be uh, George's dumb question in the interview, but is there a possibility uh, we've got this current two shot vaccination? Okay. So to handle variants, you just need to get a third or do you reach a point of diminishing returns or a point to where you don't want to get additional vaccines just because it's not good for you? Or is that don't even know, don't know the answer to that? I mean, you know, <laughs> well, you look at flu vaccines, we yeah. develop flu vaccines based on data from the year before we try and predict what strains of the flu are going to be most prevalent in society. And we develop a vaccine. Um, don't know if that's the way it's going to be for the coronavirus. We're still studying it. How long is immunity good for? Is immunity good for all these variants? These are questions that are going to be answered only over time. And as far as the distribution of the vaccine, I mean, the basic methodology, the basic um, logistics of how this is being distributed hasn't changed. I mean, maybe it's not happening as quickly as, a people, uh, as people would like, but it's still going to be the frontline workers and the people most at risk that get them. Yeah. Uh, then you'll go to age groups and, yep. and you could be looking at uh, months down the line before a reasonably healthy 30-year-old gets it, for instance. Um, has a question about kids been resolved yet? What's the status on that? Have you heard anything? Well, the FDA approved the Moderna vaccine for 16 and over, and they no, they approved the Pfizer vaccine for 16 and over. They approved the Moderna for 18 and over. So we're not going to have a read on kids for months. Um, you know, so there, they, it has not been approved for the pediatric population yet. I'm going to put this up on the screen. I wanted to share this on now. And there's no guarantee that this is going to work technologically. Let's see if I can get this to come up on the screen. I thought this was interesting. It was in USA Today. Uh, just let's see. Come on. Let's see if it comes up here. Uh, all right. It brought me up to the front page. That's not good. Uh, see if I can click along here and get to where we want to be. Because uh, it was two issues that I wanted to talk about. And it was in the health section, so we're in the line watching the sports. Oh, God, that goes on forever. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, here we go. Um, one one article was about experts argue over the vaccine dosing. Now, that, that's what we were uh, talking ab about. But the other uh, part is about the poll showing uh, increasing trust in the vaccine. And, of course, this is a huge part of this. And I was really concerned about this a lot because of the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to speak negatively of people, but uh, the, the conspiracy theorists or whatever might hold court and and scare people into not wanting to take uh, the vaccine. And for this thing to work, and again going to what uh, Fauci was talking about with uh, getting as many people inoculated as quickly as possible with these variants coming along, it's uh, very important that people be 
uh, trusting and confident in taking the vaccine. Now, it looks like that's happening. Well, that's interesting, George. I haven't seen that USA Today article, but uh, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, and this was published on December 29th, um, they looked at two they looked at polls of people at two different times. And one time was between April 1st and April 14th. And the second time was between November 25th and December 8th. And this was really looking at vaccine hesitancy. And what they found is that in the most recent poll, which is between November 25th and December 8th, about 62% of men said they would take the vaccine they were you know, likely to or somewhat likely to. And women, it was actually 51%. They were less likely to take the vaccine. So there's some vaccine hesitancy there. African-American versus white, only 38% of African-Americans said they would or would consider taking the vaccine and 39% they would said they would wait. Um, and people over 65 versus younger people, the older people had much less vaccine hesitancy. About 69% said they would consider taking it or take it versus 51% in the younger age group. Um, And then education was really interesting. So if you had more than a high school education, 70% of those people said that they would consider or would for sure take the vaccine. Whereas if you had less than a high school education, only 48% of those people would consider taking the vaccine. Um, And this really shifted in this poll there was more vaccine hesitancy in the most recent poll than in the earlier one, Uh believe it or not. Now, I think this is changing. I mean, I I really do. And and this is where we have to be very, very careful when we start changing the rules of vaccination. Because if all of a sudden we say, well, half the dose is going to be okay. When you start changing the rules, as we've seen, you know, go back to masks where we first said wear no masks. And then we said wear masks. When you start changing the rules, people's antennas go up and say, okay, what's going on here? You know, I thought this vaccine was this, now they're changing it. So we've got to be very precise at our messaging and when and how we change dosing schedules or doses. And um, because it's really important that we do vaccinate as many people as possible. And it's been estimated 15% of the population is absolutely going to refuse this vaccine. And, and can't be made to take it. Like the government. Uh, we cannot. No, in our society, we cannot. It's, this isn't China. We cannot force people to take the vaccine. Now, workplaces, schools, they can make rules where they may force their employees to take the vaccine. OK, so um, stop as there. a society, we can't do it. I wanted to ask you about that because it occurred to me with uh, the people getting the vaccine now, the frontline healthcare workers and major yeah. medical facilities. I mean, uh They've got to get it right, or can they be no, made? To, no, no okay. they, we, we. So here's the difference. So, you know, when we have we have the flu vaccine, and we do require all employees, unless there's an extenuating circumstance, to have the flu vaccine. But here's the difference with the corona vaccine. The flu vaccine is a fully approved biologic agent. The coronavirus vaccine is uh, an emergency use authorization, so it is not fully approved. Therefore, it's quote experimental. So because of that, I think ethically right now, until that vaccine um, gets full biologic status approval, then it's experimental and you can't mandate people take an experimental drug. And so there's some ethical concerns about mandating vaccines that are not fully approved by the FDA. And so I don't think until they get full biologic approval that you'll see any mandates for taking the vaccine in a workplace, because that could put places uh, maybe on some thin ice medical legally. Well, yeah, Doc, but I I mean, it kind of begs logic. It seems to me like if you go to a medical professional a hospital, you're not thinking that that person might be infected and could uh, infect you. Uh, it, you know what I mean? Well, but remember this, we don't know this either, George. We talked about this last time. If you receive the vaccine, are, can you still be infective? Yes. And we're, we're going to learn that, but we don't know that yet. Um, so if you look at our hospital in the first wave of our 1A frontline workers, 94% of eligible workers signed up for the vaccine. So a very small percentage are not receiving the vaccine. And that's locally in my hospital. Um, my son, I just got a text from my son last night. He is a, uh, first responder. He's a ski patrol. So he's a mountain first responder out in Idaho and he's getting the vaccine today. 
I was kind of surprised actually. But, first responder, yeah. But you know what? He's a ski patrol, so he is a first responder on the mountain when there's trouble. And um, so, yeah, he's getting his vaccine today, long before dad's getting it. <laughs> well, you're more in, a, in an administrative role now. Um, yeah, I'm not in direct patient care. And you know what? I, that I am more than happy to have many people go ahead of me. But let's remember, and I, again, I want to emphasize this point, just because we're rolling out the vaccine does not mean we can stop using hygiene. We can't stop with our masks. We can't stop with our hand motioning. We can't stop with our social distancing. That is in the future. So we still have to remember the best way to prevent the infection is through public health measures. It's not vaccination yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. Well, that's key because, uh, you know, I, I can uh, let my imagination run amok here. And I uh, wonder if this is all the new normal. Are we going to be wearing masks until the day we die? Are we going to have new COVID strains, uh, new variants come out that will require us to get additional vaccines? Are we ever going to get this behind us? And there's it's novel. There's no precedent for it. I mean, I look at you know, measles and mumps and polio and all those kinds of things. And they eventually were pushed into the background and we didn't have to worry about it so much in our daily lives. And I know you like to live in the present. You like to worry more about the moment than the future. But do you even let yourself think about uh, what the what the future holds for us as a, a society, as a people? No. Um, as you know, the only certainty in life is uncertainty. And if I dwell on could have, should have, would it, might be, uh, it'll drive you crazy. Yeah. So, you know, you can listen to the experts and uh, we can try and make predictions in the future. And yes, we will probably see more novel viruses, but hopefully, again, you know, history is a teacher and hopefully this pandemic will teach us how to be better prepared for the next one. And I say the next one, cause it will happen. 10 years, two years, 20 years, I have no idea. But you cannot live dwelling on what might happen in the future because nobody knows. And if you do, you're going to drive yourself crazy. <laughs> and so we have to wear masks. Okay, big deal. You know what? We all wear seat belts, right? We all got used to seat belts. We all stop smoking for the most part. We can do these things. And maybe a mask, mask becomes our normal wardrobe in certain instances. Okay, big deal. We can do it. We can do it. And, you know, when you look at what's really fascinating, though, is when you look at the amount of flu that's out there, it's down dramatically. Yeah. Why? Well, we're socially distancing from people. We're wearing masks. We're practicing better hand hygiene. And... We've taken a communicable disease and we've decreased it because of those very simple measures. So is it such a tragedy in life that we have to strap a mask on once in a while? I don't believe it is. And you know, I don't think that means wearing masks wherever you go, but I think for the next few years, you will want to, you know, in situations where there's large crowds, let's say I like to go to the symphony, there's 2000 people that sit there. I may choose to wear a mask at the symphony. Okay, big deal. You know, I go to a party where there's 40 or 50 people. I may choose to wear a mask for a few years, depending on how our vaccine works and things. No big deal. You know, I choose to wear a seatbelt because I know that that's going to keep me safer. I'm not going to launch my head through the windshield. Yes, it's a law, but it also is protecting me. So I think that, you know, as with any new change in life, it takes time to assimilate those changes into daily behavior. But once you do, then that behavior becomes second nature. Well, that's great, Doc. Uh, we kind of reached our allotted time here. This one's streaming live, so people came in probably in the middle of it. Some people may just be joining uh, the live stream. To kind of put a bow on it, to, to wrap it up, or maybe to summarize uh, what we've talked about as far as the vaccine availability, distribution, the variants, and all that, how would you like to close? Oh, like I always close, you know, life, you have to put your life in perspective and we are so fortunate in this country and you know what, we complain and we whine and we get disgusted with leadership, 
But we are so fortunate in this country. We lead the world in technology. We lead the world in medical science. We've stumbled with the pandemic, and that really is not nothing to do with science. It really has to do with our infrastructure, and hopefully we'll learn from that. But I want people to be grateful for where we are in this pandemic right now, and be grateful for what you've learned over the last nine months, how you've learned to be introspective with yourself, how you've learned to be content with yourself, and how you've learned to be content with what's in front of you and not having to use all these extraneous things like shopping and things to make you content. Um, and this is an extraordinary time and I want people to put into perspective how extraordinary having a vaccine right now truly is. And be grateful and give thanks for that. That's great. That's kind of where we started. And I think that's uh, where we're going to wrap it up. Uh, yeah. folks. That's Dr. Andrew Nish joining us on the podcast by George Liveline. I'm glad our friends on uh, Facebook got to see this live. Doc, thanks again for coming on a podcast by George. Hey, thank you. And uh, I hope everyone has a great new year and things are all going to be better. Ditto on that. Yay, brother. That's for sure. Folks, I, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you like Podcast by George. You're watching on Facebook now. Uh, that's where we're streaming it live. So go ahead and like us and uh, share it. Um, move it around on Facebook. And of course, it'll also be repurposed on YouTube. You can subscribe there and it'll be on iTunes and Spotify and the iHeart Radio app and all those places where podcasts are seen or heard. But that's going to do it. That's going to wrap it up. That's all there is. And there ain't no more. That's another podcast. Bye, George.